a little boy asked his Sunday school teacher to explain baptism. And uh, he said, well, it's when the pastor puts you under the water and tells you to think about Jesus for a while. <laughs> Fortunately, we bring everybody up. We've had no drownings yet, and we thank God for that. Today, I want you to open your Bible. We're beginning a message series. It's going to be a, a series about how we connect with God, kind of about our walk with Christ. And I'm excited about it because today we're going to kick off that message series with baptism, identifying as a child of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about the significance and the importance of this, as it is a beautiful part of the Christian faith. It is considered a sacrament, that is a religious rite, recognized by many denominations and many people around the world as a real sign of following Christ. But the word baptism did not always, always happen in the church as it is understood today. As a matter of fact, it's not a Baptist word or a Methodist word or Assembly of God word or Presbyterian word, a UCC word or a Catholic word or a Wesleyan word. It is a Greek word. Baptizo is the word, and it means to dump, it means to dip, and it means to plunge, submerge, or immerse. So it could have been used originally and was used originally to identify something like if you were going to dye material, if it was maybe a white piece of cloth and you wanted to make it purple, you would dip it in and you would be able to dye it. That was how it would have been used. It was also used to dip a cup into a bucket of water and bring it out. So it would be talking about dipping, something like that. And so these would have been common. Another expression would have been when a ship would sink at sea, it would say that it was baptized. And so it really wasn't used as a Christian word. And then in the New Testament, we read about John the Baptist. Now, he was prophesied in the Old Testament as being the forerunner of Jesus. So when he came along, he was baptizing people to identify them with Christ, to identify them with God. And so it becomes more of a Christian word in that time period. As a matter of fact, John, the forerunner of Jesus, becomes known as John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. So if you, if you go by some church and it says John the Baptist Church or whatever, or if you even see a church by the name Baptist, it gets its name off of that and off of this idea of identifying with Christ. So John gets his name, John the Baptizer, forerunner of Christ, and he is baptizing people in the River Jordan. How many of you have ever been to the River Jordan? Lift your hand if you have been there. And there are a number of hands, a few that have gone up. Hopefully more will be able to go sometime because it's a wonderful thing you probably have on your bucket list, right? To be able to go there. I've baptized a number of people in the Jordan River and it's been a wonderful privilege to stand there. As a matter of fact, while I was in the Jordan River uh, the last time, the water was cold. C-O-L-D cold even. It was real cold and I got in. We didn't really bust the ice or anything, but I got in the water and I'm standing there and I'm feeling fish. There's small fish nibbling around at my feet. It was hilarious while I'm standing there in this spot that's pretty sacred and I'm getting ready to put some people under. It was an absolutely beautiful experience to be at the Jordan and to be able to baptize people. Well, in that river is where Jesus would be baptized. So today what I want us to do is look at Matthew chapter 3, if you have your Bible or if you logged on online. Let's look at this passage here, verse 13 through 17, and consider what God is saying to us and we'll bring in other passages for the next few minutes about this sacrament of baptism this thing that we do whenever we baptize somebody. Now, Jesus gave specific uh, instructions to his followers, and the Bible gives us specific instructions in several places that we are to repent of our sin and be baptized. So baptism in this sense becomes a real symbol, a symbol publicly of what we have done internally. Now, Jesus modeled this idea, this sacrament of baptism himself in our verses here today. He comes through the Jordan River, and there is John baptizing people. We haven't read much about Jesus up to this moment, but in this moment here, Jesus comes to him and says, John, I want you to baptize me. And John says, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't baptize you. You ought to baptize me. Jesus says, no, this is what's supposed to happen. Jesus probably would have walked some 60 miles to get where he was to the River Jordan from the Galilean area. And so now he comes to this area, and he says to John, I want you to baptize me. This moment really kicks off Jesus' public ministry. Turning water to wine is his first public miracle, but this really kicks off his public ministry in a big way. And so Jesus is going to kick it off. Verse 15, it says, I want you to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And I was puzzled a little bit by that. I'll do even more digging. I know in, in the future, I'm sure, 
on this, but as best I understand it, this is talking about the ceremonial washing that a Levitical priest would do that is required in the Older Testament that Jesus now, as he enters his public ministry, would enter into a washing or a cleansing. He had not sinned. He did not need the washing, but he is doing it to fulfill the requirement of their law that he might be able to do what he was here to do by God. So what he does is he gets baptized in submission to that to fulfill all righteousness. And I think it's a good thing for us to keep that in mind whenever we try to make excuses about not getting baptized. (laughs) Jesus was baptized and it was pleasing to God. As a matter of fact, roll back to that picture you showed a minute ago that has Jesus in the water. If you'll notice uh, above Jesus' shoulder up on his upper left side there, there is a dove. There There are three things that happen in this particular picture here. And that is you'll see that, that Jesus is in the water, You'll, you can't hear it here, but in the scripture it tells us the voice of heaven is happening as God is speaking. He speaks out and says, this is my son and I am well pleased with him. So you have Jesus, God the son, you have the voice, God the father, and now you have the dove descending to light on Jesus, to land on Jesus. This is a very symbolic gesture that God does for several reasons. One, it confirms to John the Baptist, this is the Messiah. You hear the voice, you see the dove, you see the son, and now you say, wait, this is the son of God. This is Jesus. It also is a picture or portrait of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Don't bypass this too quickly, you'll miss that. It's a picture of the Trinity. It's important for us to know God is three yet one. And so the Trinity, we call it the Holy Trinity, and so we see right here a display of this, one of the more and most vivid displays of this. But something else is happening here. When the heavens open, as the scripture says, it says the heavens open and God speaks out. The heavens would open several times. Ezekiel had the heavens open back in the Old Testament, and he sees all these, all these living creatures, the chariots and the wheels in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 1. Pretty profound vision that he has. But it happened after the heavens were open. You also see that Paul says the heavens were open, and he saw into the third heaven. And when he sees into the third heaven, he sees visions that were inexpressible, he said, because they go beyond definition of human words to be able to really see them, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 of your Bible. And right here and in verse 17 of the passage, all of this happens. Now, I think something else is happening here. And I know you can read too much into symbolism, but I think something else might be happening here. Uh, you, You take what I'm getting ready to say and you process it how you want. But whenever we think about the dove, and you think back to Mary and Joseph going to give a sacrifice, you remember when they go to the temple with Jesus as a baby, they can't bring a lamb. People with a lot of money could bring lambs or bring whatever might be required. But the people who were on the social level that was pretty poor, they would bring a dove. I think one of the reasons that we might see the dove here is that that God is saying, this, my Messiah, Jesus, my son, who will suffer and die on the cross, is within the reach of the common man. In other words, you don't have to grow real tall and be real big and grown up to be able to receive Jesus. You can be a child and receive Jesus. You can be a young guy and receive Jesus. I think that is so powerful because that includes all of us. And it's a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Now, if Jesus being born into the family with Mary and Joseph as his parents being placed in a manger, having shepherds who were considered very approachable and not even able to testify in court, considered ordinary citizens. If they then would also have the great regal magi attend, who are people who would anoint kings and bring their great symbolic gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. If we would hear the voice of God from heaven and see the dove light on Jesus. In this moment... We can see right here with this dove that Jesus is within our reach. And if you have not yet placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you to go ahead and do it and ask you, why would you wait another minute? (laughs) Go ahead and place your trust in him because tomorrow is not guaranteed. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. In other words, you have now, but you don't know if you have tomorrow. Receive him now. There's another thing I notice here. We identify with Jesus Christ through baptism. Go to Romans chapter 6, and verses 1 through 4 in the book of Romans in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. 
In the book of Romans, we see here that the Apostle Paul would be talking to us, and he writes to us very profound verses that are absolutely essential for us to understand. He says to us when you come down to verse 4 that in this baptism we are identifying we are identifying with Jesus' death. His death was real, his death had purpose, and his death affects every one of us. We also read there in verse 4 that he indeed was buried. Jesus didn't just swoon, Jesus absolutely was buried. When they stuck the spear in his side, water, symbolic of pain, understanding of pain, and also of blood flowed out of him. All the blood was gone. You know, we prophesied of Jesus back in uh, the Psalms, none of, his, uh, none of his bones would be broken. You remember that? When it says that none of his bones would be broken, when a person was hanging on a cross, you know this, they would break their legs to b- cause their body to sag if they hadn't already expired. So in the afternoon or evening time, they wanted them to go ahead and die. And when it was coming Sabbath, they didn't want to leave them over the weekend. They would whack them and bust their legs till their body had to sag. Well, in that, your lungs, you can't even get breath if you're hanging on a cross crucified with your hand pinned in and your feet pinned in. You're not going to be able to breathe, so you would suffocate in that way. That's horrific, but that's what would happen. But he said of Jesus, none of his bones were broken. Your Bible says he gave up the ghost. Friend, there's a lot to this whole business of Jesus laying down his life and taking up his life. He has power over life and death. And this is powerful. And then it cites a resurrection for us. So when, in just a little bit, when we go down in the water, we're identifying with his burial and his resurrection. We're identifying that he has washed our sins and we are cleansed, made clean by him. This is absolutely powerful. Now, baptism means a lot of different things to a lot of different people besides just the sacrament of a theological or a religious rite. It means a lot. Jim Dennison was on a mission trip to East Malaysia. And while he was there, they were baptizing. And while they baptized, he noticed that a young lady who came into the church was being baptized and she had a glow on her face and it was an exciting time. But he asked one of the people that were natives to that area, he said, why are those suitcases packed over there by the door? And they said, well, her dad told her, if you go to that church and you get baptized, do not bother coming home. You're no longer one of us. Yet she has chosen to follow Jesus. I want to say to you very kindly, I know very much so for sure that some of you here are here and your family thinks you are absolutely nuts for being here. They're not following Jesus. They don't understand why you follow Jesus. And I have baptized people before whose family members have made fun of them. I want to tell you what, to stand up for Jesus is a big thing. And I thank God for every one of you who say, I am going with Jesus all the way. And I think we ought to hear it for those that stand up anyway. Not being rude, we don't have to bully about it, but we follow Jesus in this sacrament. And for some of you, your family's all behind you. But for some people, they're not. And some of you are like Olaf Tiggison. This guy lived a long time. He was a Viking of Vikings. Lived a long time ago. Say his name three times fast. It's quite a name. I had the thing pronounce it to me, and I still slaughtered it. So anyway, that's his name, and that was a real guy, and he lived a long time ago. But he was a Viking Viking. And they were going and and pillaging countries. And they were making all kinds of havoc, killing people, getting all kinds of treasures. They would steal it from people. And then one day, he was about to go into England and begin to march through England. But something happened. And he heard about a prophet. And when he heard about this prophet, and he heard about this prophet, he was intrigued. So he went over to the prophet and he said, hey, I hear you're a prophet. Can you tell me what's going to happen to me? And the prophet said, yes, you're going to have some conquest. You're going to do really well. But eventually your people are going to form a mutiny. You're going to get injured real bad. You're going to recover and you're going to become a Christian. He said, what? He went his way saying, oh, yeah, right. Everything that had been said happened exactly 
up to this point, as had been said about him. He goes back to the guy and he says to him, how did you know that was going to happen to me? He said, my God is a God of the Christians. And there are times I'll ask him to tell me what's happening and sometimes he's pleased to do it. And he told me what was going to happen with you. And you know what happened? That guy, instead of creating war, began to convert people and create peace. And for 2,000 years, his country went toward peace instead of toward evil. And that's pretty powerful because he a great leader of influence. And I want to say this to you today. Some of you are great people of influence. And by you being baptized today in the way you're going to get baptized, it's going to mean a whole lot to somebody sitting around you and to other people sitting in this audience and to people watching you online today. It's going to mean a whole lot to them. And they may absolutely turn. And family lines may turn because they witness you taking this great step of faith in this beautiful thing that we call baptism following Christ. And some of you grew up in the era of the 60s, the 70s. You heard of Evil Knievel. Evil Knievel was a dude. He was incredible. He was the most famous daredevil around. Some of you may collect his memorabilia. Some of it might be worth a little bit. Some people have found some of it to be worth something. And so Evil Knievel would jump. Oh, I still remember some of those times. He was going to be jumping over this place, or he was jumping over those buses, or he's jumping over this building, or whatever it was. Evil Knievel was getting ready to do it. You remember hearing about him? Some of you, if you're 100 years old, you remember Evil Knievel. <laughs> Knievel was not, he was not a Christian man. And he had had all kinds of accidents. Forty bones had broken in his body. Seven times he had broken his back. His pulmonary respiratory issues were significant from smoking. He had basically destroyed his kidneys and liver through drinking. He was a broken down shell of a man who once was a daredevil known as a great, great guy to jump things. But now in this broken down state, he stood at the Crystal Cathedral and I watched that service while it was happening and I was absolutely stunned and I've shared it with you before, but I want to tell you again because it was so impactful. It was the most impactful church service I've ever seen on television and I have seen hundreds of them. And I was absolutely astounded to see this man stand there and declare his faith. Perhaps I was influenced because I had seen him as a kid and thought he was something really cool. I don't know, drawing the little images of his jumping while I was at school, bored. Oh yeah, he had impacted all of us in that generation. And we're seeing this guy now stand there before millions of people around the world watching him and 4,000 people in the Crystal Cathedral. And as he shared his testimony, Robert Schuller then baptized him as Evil Knievel said, today I place my faith in Jesus Christ and I declare it through baptism. And he was baptized. It was amazing. And they opened up the place and said, who else wants to be baptized? And they baptized and baptized until the show went off the air. It was unplanned, spontaneous, beautiful exhibition of the grace of God extended to anybody who would receive the powerful transforming touch of Christ. What a beautiful moment it was. And perhaps you're like that. A lot of people know you. And maybe you're popular among your circles. Let me tell you what, we've reserved whole sections of seats for people who said, I'm bringing tons of people and family and friends with me. Hey, you go ahead and do it. We'll reserve a section. We'll, we'll name it after one of the disciples or after something. We'll, we'll do something and just be glad to bring you in and bring all of your friends in. Why not? When my grandfather and one of his friends got saved, 60 to 70 of their friends got saved. Why not you and your friends? Why not? And then I know something else. Jesus instruct, instructs us to be baptized. Jesus modeled it. He identifies, we identify with him, but he instructs us to be baptized. In Matthew, the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, tell us to go and teach and to baptize in Jesus' name. So we go locally, we go regionally, we go cross-culturally, we go around the world. That's what that scripture says. And we teach, what do we teach? We teach Jesus. When we teach him, he impacts, he transforms, he fills the void of every heart because he made everyone. And we baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing today. So we have several styles that we have done of baptism. Immersion is our most common where we put someone in the water bring them out we've had some people say could you baptize me at the river we said sure if it's low tide I don't swim I send someone down who can and they go down and they dunk you in the puddle and it works just the same we have some people who for phobias 
or for physical conditions or issues like that who are not able to be baptized. We will then sprinkle them or pour over them the water in a symbol of what is happening with the idea of baptism. Some of you that may have grown up in a very, uh, very staunch, maybe a, a little bit more uh, emphatic uh, faith background, you may say, well, that doesn't hardly count. But at Bethany Weston, we say it does count. So we don't disrespect how you were brought up or what you may have thought, but we do this. And we remember that the thief on the cross was not baptized. But he received Jesus Christ and he went to heaven. But baptism is important for us. So we seek to honor people and not minimize the sacrament of baptism, but we seek to accommodate people that we might be able to accommodate everybody in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, whether that's on a hospital bed when we sprinkle them in their last moments or right here in this room for someone who is unable to get into the tub. Now, Jesus Christ is God's son sent into the world that all the world could trust in him. He proved this through his death and through his resurrection. And he's available for everyone who will call on his name, wherever you are, whatever you're up to today. Have you been baptized since you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? What would cause you to delay that baptism? I've had people who have gone home and gotten clothes and come back for the next service and said, I believe in Christ as my Savior. Can I please be baptized? I should have done this before. And we've baptized them. I've had people say, my parents baptized me when I was an infant. Does that count? And I say, if you want that to count, sure. But if you're not comfortable and you want to make a public decree, then you make the choice because you're awake and alive and an adult and you make the choice or you're a child and you understand this. For myself, I was about eight years old when I got baptized in, in a lake out of Gene Taylor's house. <laughs> oh, he got the, uh, the cows and put them in another pasture and I'm glad he did. And then he brought sand and rock and he filled that area out and put some sticks out where the pastor wasn't going to pass. And my mom told him, he doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> and I went on out and they took me out until I was just about right here. And they, they said, because of your faith in Christ, <laughs> brought me back up out the water. And I was glad they did. But I'm so glad I'm on Jesus' team and I'm walking with him. And I really don't mind who knows it because he's done so much for me. Praise be to God. Now, those of you watching, and those of you watching at other campuses, let the pastor know you want to be baptized. From wherever you are, you let us know if you haven't been baptized, and we may, maybe we'd be able to connect someone from whatever state you're in that would be able to, with honor and decency, help you be baptized, and to be able to let you experience the joy of this sacrament, because it is a beautiful privilege to be able to follow Christ in this way as we're walking with Jesus. Now, Lord, we thank you for the beautiful provision of grace that has been given to us. Well, the, we really didn't deserve it. You would die for us. We thank you. Thank you for your resurrection, and we honor that death and resurrection through dunking and resurrecting from the water today and join you in the beauty of faith, knowing that you love us and you've called us to be forgiven. And today, Lord, we thank you that as some are declaring their faith for the very first time, and maybe some are, are just saying, look, I strayed far, but I've returned, and I just want to go ahead and do this because I'm on his side now. That's just how it is. And because they know what they're doing today is their day. We thank you. We praise you. And for these being baptized in this service and for the many people being baptized in the next service and for those being baptized at each campus in the coming weeks, we give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. amen.